Go ahead and turn your Bible to the uh, Gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter, and that's where we're going to spend our time tonight. And this message is uh, very practical for us, or it should be. Uh, your, your Bible will say the, the parable of the sower. Most of your Bibles will say that. But I want to look at uh, four responses to the gospel, because this is all about the gospel and, and, and sowing the seeds of the gospel. And so uh, this will be a very helpful section for us uh, tonight to help us to understand uh, some of the responses that we get whenever the gospel is shared. And if you've ever, and, and I say this, hopefully you've shared the gospel with somebody at some point. Right. Yeah, hopefully you have. And so you'll be able to understand because sometimes people think that, you know, just by sharing the gospel, that everybody responds to the gospel with positivity. Right. That 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 they just accept Jesus right there on the spot and everything is, is wonderful. And that's really unfortunately, that's not the, the common thing. That's not that's not a reality. Uh, so we need to understand what's happening whenever we run into these situations and how people respond to the gospel. So this will help us to kind of get our minds around what's happening you know whenever when we share the gospel not to have our expectations uh set uh, by their response or to have our our hearts broken by their rejection because whenever whenever they reject the gospel don't take it personally don't take it personally they're not rejecting you they're rejecting the gospel and they're rejecting jesus and so that's a, that's a work of the spirit that that we're called to be messengers that we we share the good news we offer eternal life we tell them about the love and forgiveness that's found in christ and if they choose to reject that, then, then unfortunately that's on them. And so, so I want us to be reminded of that. And so whenever you share the gospel with people, when you're, whenever you're out and about, you'll, you'll see uh, different responses. Some people right, will just flat out reject the gospel. You know what I'm talking about? That, that some people, me, I, that was me. I was that guy. Whenever the, the pastor wanted to come to my house on visitation, you know, they, they, they finally got Leslie to, to agree to, 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 for somebody to come visit uh, uh, Mike, you know, Leslie's, Leslie's, Leslie's husband. They go, somebody's they go talk with that man. Somebody, and so, you know, when I heard that they want to come to talk to me, I was like, I know where the church is. and Don't come to my house with that stuff. And so flat out just rejecting that. I don't want it. I don't need it. And if I do decide I want it, I know where you're at. Thank you. Have a nice day. That's just, you know, you, you'll get that sometimes. Just flat out rejection, right? That's, that's one response. And you'll have uh, some people... That, that seem to accept the gospel, right? But, but they, they fade rather quickly, right? They, they'll get excited and, and come along and they'll, you know, be, you know, you'll see them pretty regular and they'll start to be involved. But the next thing you know, hey, where's, uh, where's, where's Bob and Susie? Right, where, what happened to them? And they're gone, long, long gone. Or, or uh, another type, you know, just seem that they again seem to accept the gospel, but they depart whenever difficulties arise, right? When something, something doesn't happen or something happens in their life that's hard, or, or somebody gets cancer, or somebody dies, or somebody loses a job, and all of a sudden, you know, their, their view of God, well, he's let them down, and I'm done, right? He didn't, he didn't fulfill what I thought he would fulfill, and so they, they tend to bail out as well. But then there are those, those, those rare instances whenever you share the gospel with somebody, and they do accept Christ, and, and, you, and you're able to walk with them, and you see them grow step by step as they are being discipled. Right, they, they begin to serve and reach out, and they're uh, involved in the church, and, and they're they're going and sending, and they're actually uh, getting to the point where they're sharing the gospel with other people, and they're going and walking along with somebody and being disciple somebody else and reproducing disciples. Right, so you have all these things, and we're going to see them in our text tonight. Hopefully, we're not going to see anything that's that's new. It's just only going to uh, affirm what you already know through your own experience. We have to continually remind ourselves. That conversion of hearts is God's work, right? It's God's work, that, that he's the one who's going to change hearts, not us, right? If, it's, if we could just convince somebody with our, with our knowledge, right? If, if that were possible, that'd be one thing, but it's not possible. I've never been able to argue somebody into salvation. Anybody? You know, just, just through being logical and, and just showing them the verses in the text and, and you know, my, my information is better than your information and somebody, you're right, you win, you know, you win, I'm going to be a Christian. I haven't, I've yet to run into that person. And so uh, we need to know and remind ourselves that conversion is, is God's work. It's a, it's a heart conversion work. Uh, our, our work and our part in this process is to, to encourage uh, others to place their faith in Jesus, to, to share the gospel, right, to be witnesses. That's, that's what we do. And, and walk out the gospel for them, serve, on them, serve them, uh, love them, right, to, to minister to them in the midst of these things. Because the truth is we have no clue. 
We have no clue who's going to respond to the gospel and who's not. We don't know who's going to be a yes and who's going to be a no. All we're told to is to share the gospel, right? We, we cast seed. We cast seed and the rest of us between them and God. But I can tell you this. If we do not share the gospel, then we'll get no response. We'll get no response. If we do not share the gospel, we will get no response. So you can count on that one as well. So so tonight's passage, uh, we're going to see that uh, uh, Jesus is going to affirm these these ideas. He's going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, the the reality that that few uh, will actually accept the gospel. so, So sometimes we're like, we, we look at the Crusades, and we think of Billy Graham, and we see stadiums full of people, and at the end, as just as I am begins to play, you see the, the stadium just empty out, like everybody, everybody funnels down into that bottom where, where the altar area is, and just, you know, hundreds of people come to know Christ that, and that's what we think of. And so when we go week after week, and week after year, month after month, or whatnot, and we have none of that, right, we, we start to say, what's happening? You know, what's going on? Why, why, is, why don't we see that here? Why is it, right? Or is it just me? You know, we start to think that way is what's happening here, but we have to remind ourselves to stay faithful to the gospel. In Matthew seven thirteen and 14, Jesus talked about this, this idea of few finding their way to Christ. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. That, doesn't that push against what we're, we expect? Don't we, we, we've had this mindset when we think about, you know, the, again, those large conversion experiences, seeing these large numbers are, you know, if you get the, uh, the Baptist newsletter, it, it, they, don't, they don't tend to put in the newsletter when one person accepts Christ at Occupy 2. That don't make the papers. But when they have, you know, like an evangelism conference or, or, or a revival service and, you know, 200 or 300 make professions, that makes the papers. All right, but see, that's, that's the exception. That's not the rule. That, that the, the work of salvation is a slow work. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it, you know, it's a one soul at a time, one person at a time. And so the, the text here, Jesus is saying that there are few. There are few that find it. You know, many will reject the gospel. They take the broad gate, and, and few will accept the gospel, and they'll take the narrow gate. So this parable is going to help us. It's going to equip us to be ready for these types of responses as we share the gospel. So let me pray for us as we, before we look at our text. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the encouragement of your spirit in our lives, God. We thank you for this passage, Lord, because I know uh, for myself that, that I can struggle with this at times, Father, whenever uh, we go long periods of time and it seems as though uh, nobody is hearing the gospel, that nobody is responding to the gospel. We see no one uh, coming to faith in the gospel. It just seems like this what am I doing wrong? What are we doing wrong, Father? I read a text like this, Father, and it comforts my soul. It comforts my soul, Father, that, that it reaffirms that if we are a faithful people, if, if, if I'm being a faithful pastor, if we're being a faithful church to share the gospel with people, Father, the rest of it is up to, between you and that individual. So, God, thank you for allowing us to be part of your work, to be used by you to, to, to get the gospel to this community and get the gospel to this nation to the get, get the gospel to this world, Father. So help us to, to look at this text and learn from this text. Equip us to be better disciples. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's take a look at our text. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. It says, And again he began to teach by the sea, and a great, num- a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea, Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and he happened as he he sowed uh, that that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on the stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and, and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let them hear. All right, so we have again another one of these fantastic 
uh, 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 sections of Scripture where, where Jesus is, is doing a teaching and, and teaching a multitude, a large group. Just imagine that. You know, just imagine uh, that they're having Sunday night church, you know, a Sunday night service, and they have so many people show up that they're, they're pressing in on Jesus. There's so many people there that they're starting to push him into the water, and he finally just says, you know, hold up, hold up. He gets in a boat and launches out from the crowd because there's so many people there. So he, he pulls away onto the water where he'll be able to get some perspective on the crowds and be able to speak, and they all can hear. And so he, he begins to teach them, and these, these large groups are gathered to hear what he has to say. And so uh, he spoke to them, it says here, in, in the form of a parable. Right, a, a parable. And, and so basically, don't, a parable, the uh, best way to describe it is it's a parable is it, simply a story uh, used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. That's all it is. It's not some big, fancy, mysterious word. It's, it's just like a word picture. It's illustrations. It's, it's a, a, I can't think of the, a, a allegory or those type of things. You know what I'm saying? That he's using things that, that would, they would identify with to communicate the message. That's all it is. And so that's the means that he's using to, to speak to them. And in, in this parable, there's three key elements that he'll use. He'll use the, the sower, right? The sower is one of the main elements, right? That the, the sower would be the individual that's sharing the gospel. And then you have the seed itself, which is the gospel message. And then, of course, the, the third element is the soil. And, and the, the soil represents the hearts of the recipients of the gospel. And so that's, that's what we see in this passage tonight. And uh, Jesus, he was using a, 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 a parable that they would understand. He would use an agricultural parable because the, the people of, of that area were, were, you know, they're mostly farmers. And so they would readily understand everything that he was saying. He would not use this same parable to go into the city. You, you understand what I'm saying? Where the, the marketplace where, where, you know, it'd be foreign to them. They wouldn't understand what he means by sowing seeds and uh, the wayside and stony ground and thorny bushes. You know, the, the, the city folk wouldn't understand what he's talking about. And so that's exactly why he uses this parable to be able to, to, to relate to these people in this way. They all knew about farming and what it took to grow a crop. They, they all understood the, the, the problems that arise when you're, you're trying to work the ground, the, 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 you know, the, the weather and the nutrients in the ground and the, the moisture content and all these things. Because, you know, I, I'm not a farmer. I don't even pretend to be a farmer in, in this last year. Uh, Leslie uh, tried to, you know, we, we had a little bit of farming going on, got some, some planter boxes out there in the back, and we were able to grow a few things, and hopefully this next year we learn some mistakes from last year and do a little better. Uh, but it's not as simple as just throwing seeds out on the ground and hoping that they produce, is it? <laughs> There's a lot more work that goes into it than that. You know, a lot of preparation has to go into it, what type of dirt you have. Some things just won't grow in certain types of dirt, right, period. It don't matter what you do. You can till it up all you want and fertilize it all you want and jam a seed in it and water it and water it and water it. And guess what? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. So that, I think that th this illustration, this parable that he used, really related with these people. They, they, they understood what he was saying. So let's look at the, the, first, the first response that we see in this text, the, the wayside response, verses 3 and 4. He says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. And so what Jesus is saying here, the imagery that he is trying to, to show is, is that, that of seed falling on hard-packed ground uh, like a walking path between the fields or even a roadway, right? That, that it's just nothing there, that these little pathways between the fields, that the, you know, they don't, you, you don't be walking through your fields, right? Once you're trying to grow things and they're starting to grow, just trample them under your feet, that's not smart. So there's these little narrow paths that you walk in between in the fields and it'd be really packed in from all the traffic. Or there's, you know, paths or, or roadways. And so when you're out there casting seeds, you're just casting it everywhere. You're something, some of it gets on these hard well, walkways and these pathways, and the birds are just waiting, right? They're just waiting there. And so what, what happens is, is these seeds hit, hit the ground there, and before they can go anywhere, they're not going into the ground. They're just laying there exposed, and it just, became, it just becomes bird food, right? It's, it's quickly, it's snatched up quickly, and it's up and it's gone. And so what Jesus is saying, that the, these are those individuals that, that will listen to you share the gospel and maybe even thank you for sharing it, right? You know, not everybody's going to be rude and, and belligerent like I was, right? Some people will sit there and listen and, and thank you, and, and they'll even make comments like, you know, let me think about it. You know, I appreciate you sharing this, but let, let me have some time to think about it. Or, you know, but, but while they're, they're thinking about it, you know, nothing happens, right? No, nothing happens, you know, that, that they're totally unmoved by the gospel. And Jesus explains uh, 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 down in, in verse 15 what happens here. And this is what's unique about this parable it, Jesus explains it. Most of the time when he gives a parable, he doesn't. 
So, so, as, so as you study the Bible, and for me as a pastor, I love these sections of Scripture because I don't have to sit there and try to figure out what Jesus is saying. Jesus tells us exactly what he's talking about. And so this, this passage is a great blessing for all of us tonight. Look at verse 15. He said, And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown, and when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Right? So how exactly does that happen? Right? When we think about that, when we try to think about the, the idea of the word gets planted and quickly it gets snatched away. Well, you know, Satan will use people to, to, to tell the lost that they're, they're good people. Right? You know, somebody comes and wants to share the gospel with you, a loved one or, or, or your child. And, you know, sometimes they're, they're really searching and saying, you know, that, you, know, you know, Brother Mike said this in a sermon today. You know, and it sounded to me like he, that I'm a sinner and, and I need to get saved. And, and then what happens? Mom or daddy will say, no, baby. No, baby, you're, you're good. You're a good person. You don't, that's not you. He wasn't talking to you. You're, you're good. Right? You see what I'm saying? You all know what I'm talking about? That's not you. He's talking about them other people. Right? So, so inadvertently sometimes, you know, we're the ones that do the work of Satan, and, and we remove that. We, we, ta- we rob that blessing, and we take that away. We snatch it away. You know, that, that you know, if there are, or, you know, maybe, you know, you, you know they'll say, like, you know, you're, you're not a sinner. And, and, and if you're not a sinner, then you certainly don't need God's forgiveness, right? Because you're a good person. We talked about that a little bit this morning, right? You know, that, that, or sometimes, uh, you know, they just don't really believe in, in all this, you know, this heaven and hell business. You know, that so uh, the people are what God, what, well, Satan will use to, to, to pluck the seed away. You know, they'll move in, and sometimes well-meaning church folk will, will be the ones that undo it. Right, so people, when, when somebody comes to you and, and asks you, you know, questions about the gospel or saying, hey, look, you know, I, I listened to this sermon, I heard these people talking, and, you know, could you help me understand, I think I, think I might need to, need to get saved, you jump on it. You encourage them and you engage in a dialogue and, and start processing that, working up through them. Don't sit there and just because you know them, you think they're a good person. Don't sit there, oh, no. If anybody is you're saved, you're saved. You're a good person. I've, I've never heard you say a bad word. I've never seen you smoke or drink or, or, or none of those things. You're a good person. You don't, you don't need to get saved. You're, you're fine. I'm sure you're fine. Don't do that. Don't do that. God is working in that heart, and he's allowed you to be the one to be able to, to, to reap that harvest. And so be careful of, of those things. Be careful of those things that Satan will, will use people to do these things. But what we see is that there's no response, no follow-through, nothing at all. It's like they never heard the gospel is what happens with this type of a response. The way we response is a response of an unsaved person. Make no mistake about it. That these people that respond that way, they're not saved. They're not saved, no matter how you want to spin it. The second response we see is in verses 5 and 6. We see the, the stony response. The stony response. It says, some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately uh, sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And so what Jesus is doing here is the imagery that he's using uh, is, is that seed that was sown in the ground that had shallow, a shallow layer of topsoil over a layer of rocks or, or limestone. And so what happened is there's no means for the plant to develop any roots to sustain it. Right? It might spring up quickly. It looks like it's going to be healthy and productive, but it doesn't last very long. The, these are, are the ones, these are the overly excited and emotionally driven types of responses. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Surely you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to a, a, like a, a, a youth camp or, or, or maybe at VBS it happens a lot, or during revival services where, where just the emotions are really, really tweaked and pushed and stuff like that, and everybody's either crying or everybody, you know, just, you, y'all know what I mean? These are emotionally driven responses, that, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, everything is driven uh, by emotion and not by a heart transformation. It's all about emotion. And the problem with that is, what happens when the emotion ends? What happens whenever the feeling goes away? Right? Whenever, whenever you don't feel saved anymore or whenever that high goes away, what happens then? Well, we know what happens then. Whenever the emotion ends, whenever the feeling ends, those people disappear. They disappear. Once the excitement fades, so do they. And then Jesus again gives the response here to what, what uh, explains this uh, response in verses 16 and 17. He says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, 
and they, and they have no root in themselves and so endure for, on, for uh, only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Right? I'm sure everybody in here is sitting here and has somebody in mind and thinking about because this happens a lot. This happens. This explains a lot of people why our church roles, our membership roles are so high and our attendance is so low. <laughs> because a, a lot of folks fall into this category right here. You know, have a lot of people come and make professions, you know, during VBS or revival or whatever, some, some event, some big event. And then uh, very shortly after, we're right back where we were, you know. And so that's kind of what's happening here. This is, I would say this is probably the most common response to the gospel in many churches. And this is all driven because of the, the pressure, the pressure of the business of church, the sad business reality of the church of, of, of for pastors to produce, right? The competitive nature of the church and, and, and of the association and, and of the convention and of all these things, man. We want numbers, numbers, numbers. We need people. We need to, y'all know what I'm talking about? We need some plaques. We need some plaques on the wall. We want to be high attendance church and we want to have, be recognized for baptizing the most people in a church our size and blah, blah, blah. Well, well, good. You got your plaque. Where are the people? Where are the disciples at? You know, hooray, we got another plaque. Where are the people? It's a big problem. That's what Jesus is talking about here. What happens is whenever you, you get sucked into this idea, you, you sell the people on this easy believism that, that the gospel requires no commitment or obedience to Christ. We, it's the old bait and switch. You know what I'm talking about? You, you suck them in with, oh, no, just, just, just come, and, and there's, there's, God expects nothing of you. He, 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 just, he just wants your heart. That's it. And so, oh, that sounds good. So no commitment, no, no, no nothing, right? No, I thought somebody said something about take up your cross and die daily. What about that? Oh, don't, don't worry about that. It, we'll get to that later. Just, just, just bow your head, repeat this prayer, and, and we'll get you baptized. And so when that, whenever the, the fine print is finally read and whenever we start really pushing and start getting people drawn into discipleship and say, oh, no, there is commitment expected, that we are supposed to die to ourselves and, and to live for Christ and all these things, uh, they, they bail out, right? They, they bail out that, that whenever we, 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 they, we ask them to participate in the, in the church and, and to, to begin to serve, they say, no, thank you. Right? They, they come until they're approached about serving and, or actually get involved and they'll, they'll, they'll bail out or, or they'll come until their family or friends or coworkers begin to give them a hard time about being a, one of them church people, right? That'll happen. That'll happen too, that, that pressure, outside pressure will get to them or, or they, they come until they realize that being a Christian does not fix all their problems, right? It does not fix all their problems, that their marriage still has issues, their, their children are, are still uh, giving them problems, their, their money problems are still there. It, you know, the people that are sick are still sick, right? As a matter of fact, if we look at the Scriptures and we read the Bible, that, that, that becoming a Christian doesn't not, only, does it not only fix all of our problems, it actually adds to them, right? It adds to them that, that persecution will come for the, for the, names, the name's sake, for Jesus' sake, that, that we'll be, uh, if we're living for Him, that, that persecution will come and we'll, that, that, we'll, that troubles will come in this lifetime. So the stony response is a response, of, again, of an unsaved person. So we're, are you keeping score? We're, we're two in and two responses are, are, are of unsaved people. So we're two for two so far. Strike one, strike two is where we're at if you're keeping count. All right? Let's look at the third one, and the third response, the thorny response, verse 7. It says, And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no crop. All right, so this, this is the imagery of, of, a, of a seed falling in an area that is already full of weeds and thorns that already suck up whatever water or nutrients that are, that are in the ground. All right, I don't think anybody, again, I've already you know, confessed that I'm not a farmer, but uh, I think even I have enough sense to know that if there's a, a field that's just nothing but weeds and thorns, that's probably not a good place to plant a garden. Right, it's probably not going to be very productive for you. And so, but that's exactly what that Jesus is, is depicting here. You know, simply stated, uh, these people are too preoccupied with the things of this world to follow Jesus. Right? That's, that's really what it comes down to. They're pre too preoccupied with the things of this world. They have a, a cluttered life. They're just basically they're just too busy to follow Jesus. They hear the gospel, but, it, but if it doesn't appeal to them, it just doesn't appeal to them in comparison to what the world has to offer. Right? 
that, that, that you know, it seems like instead of, of, of God fulfilling them or, 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 or joy coming to them or, or fulfilling their, their life and, and forgiving their sins, those people can't see past it, uh, the, the temporary. It seems like, like joy, the, the, that God is all about uh, taking joy from them. He's just, don't do this, don't do that, you can't do anything. Just sit there and read your Bible and pray and shut up until you die. Don't just, just right? Or just a kill joy, and that's not true. That's not true about God at all, that, that the, the people of God should be the happiest people on earth. You know, that, that, that he's come to give us life and give us life to the full is what the word of God says. Right? They, they, they think that the, the gospel puts people into bondage instead of setting them free. That's what happens, this type of mindset, right? They, they can only think of the here and now and not eternity. And so that's a, that's a big problem. I mean, Jesus explained in, in down in verse 18 and 19 about those type of individuals. He says, now these are the ones who's uh, one sown among thorns. They're the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in, entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The call of the gospel is to come and die. Right? That's the call of the gospel. The call of the gospel is to come and, and die to yourself. The call of the gospel is to give yourself over to the lordship of Jesus. That's what the gospel requires and demands. It's, it's, it's about being generous with your time and your money and your resources, not being greedy and self-centered. Right? It's, it's all those things. It's, 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 it opposes those things. It's about having less so that others may have more. Right? That's what the gospel is about, following Christ. It's about serving others and not being served. And so we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're entering into that time of year where we're able to see this played out, right? It's, the holiday season is upon us, and you're going to see some crazy stuff uh, on the news over these next few weeks as, as Black Friday approaches. And we're going to start to see how people, what people really love, right? Even, even, even God-loving people will seem, tend to get sucked into this madness and lose their minds in materialism takes over for, for, a, for a couple of months here around the Christmas season. We, we see it every time of the year that, 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 that people uh, will, will just bury themselves in material things and trying to find their happiness and fulfillment uh, in, in things, and material things, uh, all the things that the world system has to offer and that the world will tell you that you need, right? You need these things. They're not wants, right? Not wants, they're needs. You need to have this this, this coffee maker. You need to have this, this juicer. You need to have this TV. You need to have this, right, whatever, this, this new car that talks to you and you got seat warmers and, you know what I'm saying? All these things that, that you really need to have in your life and it's just, what it's doing is it's sucking you in. You know, it's drawing you in and pulling you further away from the Lord, right? And so we have to be careful. We have to be careful about these things. And Satan will, will use all these things to distract and to blind people to their need for Jesus, uh, it's a distracting, a distraction tactic. That's why, why John wrote what he did in, in his first epistle. In 1 John two fifteen and, uh, and 17, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This thorny response is a response of a lost person. Three for three. Three for three. But take heart. We have one more left. We got, we got one more bullet. We got one more bullet. This first three were does. We got one more left. Let's look at the fourth response. The good response. Verse eight. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold, or some 100 and so what we have here is the, the imagery of a bountiful and luscious crop, right? Moist and nutrient-rich ground and that, that produces an incredible harvest. I'm not a, a math major either. I'm not a farmer nor a mathematician, but I can understand that 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, that's pretty big. That, that's huge. That's a huge return. And so what you're seeing here is you're seeing you know, production and growth is what we're saying here. This, this is the only genuine response to the gospel that leads to salvation. This is it. This is the only one of these four. This is it. So, you know, this is this. We need to pay attention to this one. This is where the, the individuals, they, they've heard the gospel. They've understood the gospel and they were obedient to the gospel. That's that's what this is all about. Obedient, hearing it, understanding it and being obedient to it. They increase and they produce gospel fruit. 
They increase in their knowledge of God's Word, which leads to an ever-increasing application of God's Word, right? I, I, I've been hammering away on that. It's not enough to hear, the, hear God's Word, but we have to be doers of God's Word. That, that's, how, that's the checks and balances. It's not that James said to be doers of the Word, not hears the words only. What's it say after that? Deceiving yourself. Right? Deceiving yourself. He's talking about that, that, that if we hear God's Word, Right? And we know God's word, but we don't do God's word. We might be deceiving ourselves because it's all in what you do. It's, it's how you respond to God's word. It's not, it's not enough to say, I know God's word says I'm supposed to love people, but I don't want to love people. I know God's word says I'm supposed to be generous, but I don't want to be generous to people. I know God's word says I'm supposed to forgive people, but I don't want to forgive people. Well, if you don't want to forgive people, you don't want to be generous to people, you don't want to serve people, you may have a heart problem. You may have a heart problem. You may not even be saved. That's, that's what the Word of God is saying. So he says to be careful here. This, this maturing process, this discipleship process uh, is, is an ever-increasing uh, 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 amount of uh, uh, gospel fruitfulness. It's, it's a growth in Christ. These people deny themselves and take up their cross daily. They, they become smaller and Jesus becomes bigger in their lives. Does that make sense? Right, that, 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 you know, that, that we become less important. You know, our, our goals, well, we really don't have goals anymore. Jesus has goals. And our priorities, we really don't have priorities anymore. Jesus has a priority. And so we align ourselves. The, the, the good ground, the, the true disciple of Christ, realigns their lives with the life of Jesus. Right? What Jesus says we do, that's what we do. What Jesus says is our priority, that's our priority. What Jesus' plan is, that's our plan. That's what we're saying here. That's what this, this gospel, this good ground is all about. And that's what Jesus said in, in verse 20. He explains it. He says, but these are the ones sown on good ground, those who heard the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So the, probably the most significant piece of fruit uh, that, that the, they're act, is, is that they're actively cast, casting gospel seed as well. Right? You, you, you know... That, that somebody has truly been saved whenever they're, t- they're sharing the gospel with somebody else, right? That's a big piece of fruit. That's a good telltale thing. Uh, I, I appreciate church attendance. I appreciate Bible study, and I appreciate prayer. But really st- what really st- makes a person stand out to me is somebody that's t- sharing the gospel, that's making disciples of all nations. That's, that's what really stands out to me. Uh, and I think that's what, what's, what Jesus is saying here. He's making, making sure the emphasis on, is on this casting the seed, that sharing the gospel with others. They're, they're out and about telling others about the forgiveness and the grace of God. They're telling people about eternal life is what they're all about. That, and that, that God, and again, God uses everybody differently, right? We know that. And so, you know, don't be discouraged if you feel like, you know, you're here and this person's here and this other person's here. And, well, I can't, I, I'm not where they're at. I don't know as much about the Bible as they know about the Bible. And I, stop comparing yourselves like that. Don't, don't do that. The enemy will use that to, to sow disunity, right? You, you be you, right? You be you and let me be me. And, and, and God will use us both, right? Right? And, and so, but, but, but strive to, to, to grow. Strive, strive to be all that Christ would have you to be, to, to not be a perpetual babe in Christ, like we talked about earlier tonight, to grow up. To be mature in the faith, he uses everybody differently. But but God has promised that that that, that if we seek Him, to find Him, that 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 He will that He will prosper us to, to grow us to be faithful and to be fruitful. Uh, Luke eleven nine and ten says, uh, "So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you; seek and you will find; knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened." Right another one of those promises right if you want to know ask right seek knock and, and he said that he will do it he promised to open these things and reveal them to us personal spiritual growth missional living and the casting casting of gospel seed is the kind of fruit that jesus is looking for from his people that's what he wants that's what he wants from us and so the the good response is the response of a saved person this this last one is the, is the only one so as we finish our time tonight, the sad reality is not that not uh, everyone that hears the gospel will respond to it in a saving way, right? That's the sad reality is that, that not everybody is going to respond to it in a saving way. The, 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 the math, I, I can't do simple math. And so one, one in four, I know that's 25, 25%. So you're looking at 25% is what Jesus is, is showing us in this parable. 25% of, of people that hear the gospel respond to it in a, in a saving way. 
And that kind of lines up with what he, he said in the other passage about uh, the, 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 the gospel, uh, few, few finding the way that leads to life, right? And so, so don't lose heart, right? When, whenever somebody rejects the gospel or doesn't, doesn't accept Christ right then on the spot or, 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 or never does, if you've been faithful to share the gospel with them and, you, and you're faithful to continue to pray for that individual to come to faith, then look, you, you've been a good and faithful servant. You've done well. That is success in the eyes of the Lord at that you have done what, what you have, he has called you to do. Right? This, this parable uh, does something for us. It, it places uh, squarely the responsibility of belief or unbelief on the individual here in the gospel. Y'all see that? Did y'all pick up on that? Right. But it's, it's not, it's not the, 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 the soil is the, the factor in the, in the belief or the unbelief, not the sower and not the seed, right? See, that gets twisted around a lot in churches, that if something's not happening in the church and not enough people are getting saved or making professions, whose fault is it typically? Pastor. It says the pastor. We need a new pastor. We need a new pastor. Ain't nobody getting saved. We need to get a new pastor. This parable says it's not the pastor's fault. It's, 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 it's the individual's fault. Now, let me be clear. Let me, a footnote. If the pastor's not sharing the gospel, then it is his fault. If the pastor is not equipping his people or, or, or encouraging them to share the gospel, it's the pastor's fault. You need a new pastor if that's the case. But typically, that's not the case. You have a faithful pastor who faithfully proclaiming the gospel, a church that's faithfully reaching the community and sharing the gospel with other people, and, and people start coming to faith. Let's just trust God. Let's just trust God and be faithful along the way. That they trust God that He's going to give the increase, and those that that come to uh, faith will, will be the ones that He has drawn and responded to the gospel because of His leading. We have to realize that He is the Savior, not us. Right? He is the Savior, and so the, this this idea, these responses, we we can't afford to be wrong about the the this, these different soul types. We can't. Uh, misevaluate what's happening. We need to be able to tell the signs and read the so, read the soil and, and and be fruit inspectors. You know what I'm talking about? And they, they say we're not to judge people and all that kind of stuff, but we are to be fruit inspectors, and we're supposed to examine one another, right? What's going on in, in the lives of, of church members and our friends and our families? You know, we can't be afford to be wrong about this because in Matthew seven, we have this terrifying uh, warning that this scripture. Every time I read it, it, it just it just chills me to the bone. Because I fear so many people are going to hear this one day. Matthew seven twenty one twenty three says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawless, lawlessness. And that's sobering, right? That, that, that we, could get, we could get to the end of our days and say, well, you know, I, I made a profession, right? I signed a card. I did, I, I, there was this moment in time way back when when I did, I, I did this thing, so, and now you're saying, depart from me, I never knew you. What, what happened? What happened? Right? Truly saved people, the good ground. Those people's lives are marked by submission and obedience to the will of God. Right? That's what it just said right here. The, the, the ones who do the will of God, that's, that's what, what seed that falls on good ground looks like. And the scary thing is that some people will spend their whole life, spend their whole life attending church and, and Bible study and still wind up in hell. What a tragedy. What a tragedy to be so close to eternal life and miss it. Right? So we have to get this straight. We have to be right about this that t- tonight. Jesus offers forgiveness and eternal life to, to all that place their faith in him. So I was asked what a simple question. What type of response will you have for him tonight? What type of soil are you? Right. Only you can answer that question. Let's pray and we'll have a time of response. Father, thank you again for this day. Father, we thank you for this passage. Lord, a very sobering passage. A shocking passage, God, where we live in a day and an age where uh, these these mass uh, 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 professions of faith, these these large uh, uh, crowds of people making professions, and, and and just crowds of people getting baptized, God, we 
We don't know. And, and Lord, I, 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 I don't want to be cynical about these things. Father, I pray that every person that, 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 that makes a profession, every person that is, that is baptized in these, in these services, God, that are truly saved, I, I do. I honestly do. I, I would love nothing more for that to be the case. But God, I also know just from my own personal experience that, that's, that so many people will make responses to the gospel and, and it just doesn't take hold. So, Father, I, I, I don't believe that, that the Bible teaches that we lose salvation. I believe that the, the Bible teaches us that we can make a false profession of faith. So, Lord, I would ask tonight for everyone in this room, God, and those that will listen to the, the podcast later, that they would search their hearts, Father, right now, that you would reveal to them the reality of their salvation, that you would re- reveal to them either their, you would confirm that their salvation is genuine and true, or you would prick their heart and reveal that they're lost that they're lost, God, that, that, that they've been living a lie, that they've been playing a game, that they've been pretending to be a follower of Christ. So, Father, I pray tonight all these things would come to an end, that you would reveal the truth of the situation no matter what it is and help each one of us to have the courage to respond in the way that you'd have us to do it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.